Yo, what's up guys? Hope you're all having an amazing start to your week. In this video, I'm gonna do a full breakdown of how I prepare for every single week um, and look at the charts, look at things from a fundamental perspective, all of that, how I look forward to the coming week. Because uh, a lot of you guys requested it and I put it up on my Instagram, which if you don't follow me there, do that, I'll put a little thing up. But um, a lot of you guys wanted me to post this. So here it is, I'm about to show you the full breakdown. It's gonna be a bit on the longer side in terms of length goes, but that's just because I wanna give you guys as much value as I can, show you guys how I actually do this, not give you guys a quick little rundown, um, but go really in depth and basically do almost my full weekly prep for you guys. Um, and yeah, this is what I usually share with the guys in the Swing FX uh, group, right? That is the company I created to teach traders how to trade using fundamentals. Um, so if you wanna learn more about that, hit the link down below and uh, let's jump right into it. Hold on, hold on. But before we do, make sure to hit that like button down below and do hit that subscribe button. Um, it does help the channel grow a lot. It tells YouTube that this is good content and it's stuff that people wanna see and push out to other traders. So do that for me, it's a great help. Let's jump right into it. It is 11.11 everybody for another 10 seconds, make a wish. All right, now that we got that out of the way, let's jump right in how I prepare for the week ahead. Now this, I've listed out general guideline for how I go about it, right? How I start working on it and then where I sort of finish off. Um, but I do want to point out, I don't do it exactly always in this order. This is just the general flow of how I uh, go about doing it. But it's not always, I don't have like, oh, now I'm moving on to step three. Now I'm moving on to step four. It's more just, this is what I do and this is how I listed it out. Um, and this is the general order. So I start off by recapping the previous week fundamentally and technically, right? So I look at the charts, I look and I just go back into my head <laughs> about the fundamental part, right? Because I'm keeping track of it all week. So it's not like I need to go back and look at what happened. It's more just I need to recap it in my mind, right? Um, so recap the previous week, what happened fundamentally and technically. Uh, so I get a good understanding of where the markets started off and where it ended. And, you know, more importantly, where it ended, right? What happened at the end of the week that might carry on into this week? So that's number one of what I do, right? So I look and then this sort of is this in the same boat as number one. At the same time, I'm looking at which fundamental themes impacted the markets the previous week and which are likely to stay slash are not yet priced in slash are uh, so important that they will, you know, carry on past that week. Right, so these I sort of do at the same time. Then next up, and not always again in this order, I'll look at the economic calendar, right, like data and central bank stuff uh, to see what's, if there's anything important in the coming week, right? This is probably the least important part of all of this is looking at the economic calendar. Usually there's not much that's important, but sometimes there will be a central bank meeting or a certain piece of data that might be important, right? Um, so that's number three. Then I move on to determine a bias for each currency, right? So after I've recapped, uh, recapped the previous week, then I have a good idea of where each currency is sitting going into the week ahead. Um, you know, I'll look at if there's any news over the weekend and then go about determining a bias for each currency going into the week ahead, right? So is this currency, do I think it's strong, kind of strong, neutral, kind of weak, um, or, you know, really weak. Then after I have a bias for each currency, then I pair strong ones with weak ones and determine which pairs I'm going to trade out of <clears throat> the 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 few pairs i look at i'll pick out the pairs i'm specifically going to watch to take a trade and of course i'll know which direction if i'm going long or short then the final step after doing this right i have my fundamental bias 
um, things I'm gonna look out for, which pairs I'm looking at, which direction. Then <clears throat> I will go and look at the technicals, right? Draw out support resistance, draw out trend lines, Fibonacci, um, look at price action and start planning out maybe potentially a trade idea, right? Like this area I'm looking to get in, this is where stop would be, etc. <clears throat> right? Uh, and that's the last step. And then I'm ready for the week. I'm prepared. I know what I'm looking for. You know, I know what I'm thinking. All that stuff. All right. So now that we got the general overview out of the way, let's jump right into recapping the previous week fundamentally and technically. Uh, and to do that, we're just going to go on the charts here. <clears throat> because like I said, the fundamentals are in my head pretty much. So I'm not going to go look elsewhere for them. Uh, I'm just going to look at the charts and, you know, recap it in my mind, right? So let's start off here. Here we have GJ. Um, and FYI, these uh, are all moving averages. I have, uh, you could probably see it better on the one hour chart. I have, um, it's very simple, right? It looks like a lot, but it's really not. I have the 50, which is the greens, 50 moving average, 100 moving average in the red and then the white is the 200 moving average um, and I have both the simple and exponential which is why um, you know there's double of each I have both the simple and exponential moving averages for the 50 100 200 so now they got that out of the way um, let's get right into it right so GJ and um, also I'm just gonna be talking about individual currencies alongside individual pairs gj pushed higher a partially the pound was quite resilient last week right looking at gu we had a strong sell-off at the start of the week caused by of course uk lockdowns um and there's a variant in the uk of the covid that is more contagious right so all these things pretty negative we saw a strong sell-off also partially caused Looking here at the DXY dollar index, partially caused by a spike in the, uh, I think it was here, spike in the US dollar, which will send both the euro down, right, as we saw, where is it, start of the week here, strong sell off on the euro, and on the pound, partially caused by flows into the US dollar, right, because of risk off, meaning fear. And we can also tell that by looking at AJ. Uh, let's see the fourth here, right? We can see sell off on um, AJ as well, which is a key barometer of risk sentiment, fear and greed um, because the Australian dollar does well when there's optimism, the yin does well when there's fear. So exact opposites. So that's why it's a good indication. And that's why you can see over the last few months, there has been lots of optimism, right? Lots of buying of the Australian dollar, lots of selling of the yen. So the, that's partially why GJ headed higher is because the yen has been weak. The yen has been weak for some time, right? Again, looking at GJ, it's been an uptrend. You can tell. So the yen has been weak, partially causing this to head higher. The pound, like I said, pretty resilient held support wasn't super strong right this was this was uh partially caused by yin weakness not necessarily pound strength um so with that being said um you know and, and we could see that with price action right we can see that the the pound was n somewhat neutral right wasn't super strong wasn't super weak um you know somewhere in the middle so with that being said, the reason, right, again, I, we need to look at the technicals and fundamentals. The reasoning was the pound overall had some pretty good news in the last month. We had a Brexit deal that passed um, right around Christmas time, which um, is a great thing. It's a great thing for the UK, and it sort of has a little backdrop carrying over into the new year, right? So if that didn't happen the pound would probably be much lower, or at least lower. Not sure how much lower, but it wouldn't look like this. But we have that nice support there, um, that, that Brexit deal, right? But like I said, we also had national lockdown. 
UK variant, lots of COVID um, cases in the UK. So naturally has conflicting forces, right? So that is the reasoning um, that I think the pound has been kind of somewhat neutral. <sighs> right, so that kind of covers GJ. Um, the pound neutral for that reason, the yin weak because, um, and of course, uh, the Australian dollar and New Zealand dollar both are risk currencies, meaning when there's optimism, they head higher. So they're, they're pretty correlated. And the yen does the opposite of that, right? Because it's a safe haven. So really, um, I have sort of one analysis for all three of those currencies, Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, and the yen, because they all move according to similar fundamentals, right? Of course, that's not always the case. Sometimes there's stuff with central banks and that throws it off. But um, in general, that's the case, right? So, with that being said, the reason that there was optimism in the markets last week, as you can tell with the strong run higher on AJ um, and NJ, is because of the Georgia runoff elections. So, because um, Democrats won, and it was sort of expected going into the runoff elections, that the Democrats would uh, win at least one of the seats. Turns out they won both, right? And the reason this is good for risk sentiment, right? Keeping politics aside, um, right? Because that's not what the markets care about, right? The markets aren't necessarily rooting for one side or the other. It's more so just based on facts that if the Democrats won, uh, the, the chances of more stimulus being passed are higher, right? Because um, they're more keen on uh, more stimulus, right? So because of this, markets like that in the sense that more stimulus is, in just in general, good, right? It's better for the economy, uh, ignoring, of course, the downsides of hyperinflation, blah, 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 right? The market doesn't care about that right now. They just care about stimulus. So um, basically, that was all good. Good stuff. They won. Uh, more stimulus is likely coming, and so the market is pricing that in. It's pricing in more stimulus coming. Um, so that's basically the key reason that the markets were in a very good mood last week. You know, despite uh, everything that happened in the U.S. Uh, you know, with uh, Trump and you know the riots that occurred. That doesn't really impact the economy too much, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of scary for the average American, but in terms of the economy, it doesn't affect it all too much. So the markets don't care about that too much, right? You always have to think with an economic mind when you're looking at trading, right? Will it affect the economy, yes or no? Right? Democrats winning will because it means there's likely more stimulus, which directly affects the economy. So with that being said... That's essentially uh, what happened last week, right? Uh, last thing we need to analyze, because I talked about the pound, right? The pound was sort of neutral last week. Um, the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar were strong last week, and the yen was weak last week, right? So those bases are all covered. The last currency that I look at mainly is the euro, right? So let's talk about it. The euro, like I said, at the start of the week, um, pushed higher. But, you know, the fundamentals don't really... There's not any strong fundamentals for the euro at this point, right? Nothing really. I mean, yes, they finally passed uh, some vaccines. So, you know, we got some vaccine distribution coming. That is good. And yes, that does support the euro a bit. So that's an argument to make. But uh, this has also mainly been fueled by U.S. dollar weakness, right? Because if money flows out of the U.S. dollar, the second largest currency is the euro. And so money flows into that and vice versa. So look at the chart here on DXY. The dollar has been selling off. What does that mean for the pound? Or sorry, the euro. Well, the euro and the pound, but more so the euro. Heading higher, right? So uh, now so that the, the US dollar uh, seems to be possibly seeing a retracement and we could see next week uh, a move higher, right? Because no trend is gonna last forever. Uh, and this has been a very large sustained trend with a lot of people shorting it, 
So, you know, it seems to be almost the end of its move. Doesn't mean it won't continue lower, but a pullback is due. Profit taking is due, right? Uh, at some point. So what, that, what does that mean for the euro? Well, that means I'm pretty neutral on it right now, right? Because the, the dollar, you know, you can guess, but honestly, next week could head lower, could head higher. It's like a 50-50 shot, all right, uh, in my opinion. Because it's based more around investor uh, sentiment than actual fundamentals, right? Because this was the fundamental part. It was heading lower. But once it gets near the end, it's more so... Is there enough sellers to sustain it or is it just going to be profit taking and we'll see uh, a pullback, right? That has nothing to do with fundamentals. And that's not really something you could predict. So um, that's why also you don't want to chase any trends. And I'll have a video up about that this week of when you can spot when a trend is going to end, right? Some, some signs. So keep an eye out for that. But I'm neutral on the euro, right? No strong fundamental supporting it. The dollar, you know, looks like it could be uh, pulling back, which would mean a deeper pullback most likely for the euro. So for all these reasons, no strong fundamental driver. And when that is the case, right, um, nothing really going on with the ECB, which is a central bank in the, the uh, euro uh, zone, then I'm neutral, right? Nothing happening. I'm not going to try to force something that's not there. I'm just neutral on it and I will trade it accordingly. I will pair it with either strong or weak and trade it like that, right? Um, so with that being said, uh, that was recapping last week, right? I get it. It takes a while. This isn't necessarily a super fast process. So we recapped the previous week. Boom. Now, which fundamental themes impacted markets? Well, the Georgia runoff elections was one. Um, UK lockdowns was another one, right? Uh, we have stimulus coming, potentially. So that's a theme that's going to be more important next week than it was this week, because this week it was Georgia runoffs. And I would say those are the main ones, right? Those are the main themes of last week. Uh, but one to keep an eye on and one that I am keeping an eye on uh, that wasn't important last week, might not be important this week, but something in the back of my head, and I've been telling uh, the Swing FX members this to, to keep in mind and keep an eye out for, is uh, new COVID variants, right? We've heard talks that there is new strains, that some are more, uh, what's the word, transmittable, maybe? They're more contagious, let's say that, they're more contagious. Which is a little worrying, but as long as the vaccines work for them, then it shouldn't be too big of a problem, right? So the big if, and something I'm watching for, is if studies start coming out and scientists start coming out saying that these new vaccines that were just created, you know, a month, two months, three months ago, they will not work on the new strains of virus. That is a huge risk for markets, right? Let's look at here, AJ, on the daily chart. There is strong greed strong greed and you can see that with the stock market right there's lots of greed hitting all-time highs this is the uh s p 500 right so hitting all-time highs so with this strong greed if it, that is the case this new variant new strains are not effective with the vaccine then i think we'll see a huge downside risk uh for um sentiment right which would have big effects on the forex market it would mean the australian dollar new zealand dollar would become very weak the yen would become very strong most likely the dollar would become very strong and the euro and the pound would most likely sell off a bit too right if that happened and pos probably gold would see some buyers uh right so with that being said those were the themes last week what are the themes that are likely to stay or are not fully priced in? Well, I would say um, stimulus coming is not yet fully priced in, most likely, because um, there hasn't been the actual bill out or like, um, you know, any actual real proposal that's going to be voted on, right? It's more just talk and speculation. 
granted it's um, high probability that's going to happen but the fact that it hasn't yet happened means I think there's some more room for it to be priced in right there's some more optimism to be made in the markets but um, this is not a trend that I want to hop in at right now right uh, risk assets risk currencies are very overextended right uh, and you don't want to chase a market because you know who knows when it's going to be the top right there could be profit taking and then this thing just shoots down so this is why you don't want to chase moves even if the fundamentals support it right you need both a good technical entry and a fundamental idea uh, you can't have one or the other because you know you'll risk taking unnecessary losses so with that being said i think stimulus is something going into next week to keep an eye out for if we start seeing the ball rolling on maybe like two thousand dollar stimulus checks or another type of stimulus deal which would provide more optimism for the markets then um you know i would think that there'd be more risk on flows meaning flows into the aussie new zealand dollar um and then flows out of the yen and possibly dollar us dollar um right that's what risk on flows mean now in regards to the euro again i'm neutral there's not really anything happening so just keeping an eye out for maybe a comment from the ecb or something interesting to happen with the uk or eu you know maybe a new strain comes out or more lockdowns or maybe fast distribution or problems with distribution of the vaccine Right, all those things are something to possibly keep an eye out for, but in general, no themes carrying on into the week for the euro, right? Because there wasn't any last week. So last week we just have uh, the pound, and any theme to carry out, honestly, not necessarily, right? Because the Brexit deal, yeah, might provide some more optimism um, if there's not much going on. So that's something to keep in mind, but that's not really something you can track. Right. It's just something you need to have in the back of your head that, hey, maybe the pound will be resilient going into the week ahead because we still have that Brexit deal that um, happened. Right. That's very good news. So something to keep an eye out for. And in regards to the lockdown and the COVID strain, well, they're already under national lockdown. Right. That's sort of the worst that they can do. They can't do much more than that. So that's pretty much priced into the pound at this point. Right. Um, I think that's over with, right? So I don't think um, that will be a factor for the pound. But uh, hey, if COVID cases keep on rising in the UK, then still the market could head lower, right? So um, the pound, like I said, I'm pretty neutral on. It could head either way, just depending on what the market sentiment is. Um, and we'll have to judge price action, right? Um, that's the only way to tell at this point. Right, we can't go talk to every investor and see what they're thinking, so we just have to look at the price action. If the pound remains, you know, more bullish, then we have to assume, uh, you know, the market is still looking at the Brexit deal. But if it starts selling off further, then it's more concerned with what's happening with COVID in the UK, right? So, with all that being said, I feel like we covered that, so that's done. Um, so now we're looking at the economic calendar. Any interesting data or economic events coming up for the currencies that I trade, which, like I mentioned, is mainly the pound, the euro, Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, and the yen. Those are the main ones I focus on because uh, I know them the best. So here I use FX Street for my economic calendar. Generally, they all have the same thing, so it really doesn't matter. You know, you can choose any economic calendar you want I just use this one and works fine so um, so this is all the economic events we have for those currencies that I mentioned right the pound Australian New Zealand dollar and um, the euro I think I covered all of them but you know what I mean so um, anything important well and I really I'm only looking for red right I'm looking for high impact events uh, all this other stuff like the yen bank lending or uh, the euro wholesale price index that doesn't have a huge impact on currency prices right it doesn't um, so I kind of just ignore it right it's not important generally big fundamental drivers 
are macroeconomic things, not necessarily data. Especially with all the craziness going on. When there's not a whole lot going on in the world, like last year in 2019, I mean, there was still a lot, but comparatively, when the markets are more quiet, then data becomes a bit more important. The markets are more focused on things like data. So anyways, we're looking for the red. Here we have Australian dollar retail sales. That might influence the price for like, you know, an hour or two after it comes out, uh, especially if there's a big difference in the, you know, the consensus in the previous. Might move it around for a second, but in general, it won't create any long-term trend. So that's pretty much ignored. Next, we have the pound. Um, we have a Bank of England, uh, Governor Bailey. We have uh, Governor Bailey speaking. And we have another uh, Bank of England member, but the governor has more weight, right? Because he, they're sort of the lead of the, uh, the central bank, right? So this is something I will actually be keeping an eye on. This is kind of important. Now, depending what he says, it's important, right? If he just says something basic that doesn't really matter, doesn't impact markets, then, you know, it's kind of like, okay, it won't affect the pound, it won't do anything. But if he says something about the policy, which is different than what's expected, that's something interesting. Mainly what I'm looking for is ta any comments about negative interest rates, right? Because the pound, um, or sorry, the Bank of England doesn't have negative rates. Rates are very low, interest rates are low, but it's not negative. So if he says, hey, we're moving closer to negative rates, or you know, we're planning on it, you know, whatever, if he says something about moving more towards negative rates, that will probably be a negative for the pound, right? Because that isn't fully priced in, the fact that they're going into negative rates, which is bad for the pound, right? Lower interest rates are neg generally perceived as negative for a currency. So that's what I'm looking for. But if he doesn't says it, if he doesn't say anything about negative rates, then it's just kind of whatever. Um, and it doesn't matter, right? So nothing really Tuesday, nothing really happening Wednesday, nothing really happening Thursday, right? Just more data um, that doesn't have a huge effect on long-term currency prices. And Friday, there's also nothing. So um, yeah, really. So the only thing I care about this week is Governor Bailey's speech. And even that might not matter. So this is why, you know, I say that data doesn't really matter a whole lot right literally there's only one thing i care about on this whole list of stuff so that's done right so we only have a central bank speaker that's kind of important so now we are getting into determining a bias for each currency which i kind of already done right doing my recap of last week talking about it kind of i'm already starting to form biases about these currencies so let's determine a bias for each currency going into the week ahead. So first off, the pound. What am I thinking? Uh, I'm pretty neutral on it, to be honest. Um, like I talked about, no strong drivers for the pound. It's just mainly going to be uh, what's the sentiment, right? What's investor sentiment? And also what happens with the US dollar, right? Because that does partially influence uh, where the pound heads not as much as the euro like i said but a little bit so pretty neutral no strong drivers nothing really uh too exciting going on in the uk so i'm going to say i am uh neutral <clears throat> so pretty neutral on the pound great next up let's talk about the euro also neutral right like i said nothing really happening um with Europe right now, <clears throat> right? We, I mean, we do have vaccine distribution going out, which is good. They are still in pretty strict lockdown. So overall, pretty neutral. Um, also, because the US dollar risk, right? We could see this thing continue higher because it did break this, uh, <clears throat> you know, strong resistance. So we could see this thing heading higher, which would cause the euro to go lower. So overall, 
I'm just going to say I am neutral on it. I'm not going to guess a direction. I only want, you know, I'm only going to pick a direction if I'm pretty confident and I'm not confident in any one direction. So I'm neutral. Next up, Australian dollar. Uh, I'm going to say uh, I'm pretty bullish on it, right? There's nothing really negative happening at the moment. Like I said, yes, there was some craziness happening in the U.S., but in general, right now, it doesn't seem to be impacting anything economic or policy-wise. So, you know, that's sort of pushed off to the side. Right? Um, and then, what else? What else? Well, then, I I'm, I'm bullish because I think the more stimulus is on the way. Right? There's more vaccine distributions happening. People are finally getting the vaccine. Um, you know, overall, decently good things going on. And um, in case you're thinking, I'm, I also just want to point this out. Huge, huge, huge point you don't want to miss for those of you who are still watching. Because um, this is a pretty long video. But a big point is I know the things the market cares about because I've been watching it and watching price action for months and months and months and months. Right. Uh, so these things such as vaccine distributions these things such as stimulus, I know that they impact markets, right? I'm not just plucking random things out of thin air that sound good, right? I know these things are what investors care about and banks and stuff care about and what will actually influence currency prices. So that's why I'm talking about these certain things, right? That's just a big point I wanted to say is I'm talking about this stuff like like vaccine distribution because I know it impacts currencies and the only way you do that is just through watching and studying the market right so just just a disclaimer there right so for all those reasons decently good stuff happening I'm bullish on the Australian dollar and naturally on the New Zealand dollar but I am less bullish so I'm just gonna say kind of bullish reasoning is because if we're looking here at Australia New Zealand the pair Right, the Australian dollar has been much uh, stronger. The New Zealand dollar has not been quite as strong, and recently we just broke this strong resistance. Um, so there's possibility for more upside. So that, for that reason, I would rather be, uh, you know, I'm more bullish on the Australian dollar than New Zealand dollar because it's well just stronger than the New Zealand dollar. Very simple. Um, so I'm kind of bullish on those two because I think they will be more risk on flows coming soon. And then the yen, uh, I am bearish because, well, for two reasons, mainly because, again, I think there's going to be optimism um, because of the stimulus and vaccine distributions, uh, which is, you know, all good stuff, especially if we start getting actual policy with the stimulus, a.k.a. You know, they start talking about details for another stimulus to be passed. It's not just talk, right? But um, so, yeah, if we see that next week, I think that will spark more optimism, which should sell off the yen. Another reason, uh, you know, to a less important extent is that the uh, Bank of Japan and, well, just Japan does not like when the yen gets too strong, right? They like having a weaker yen. And they've come out and said that they want a weaker yen, which um, and that they will intervene if they have to, which is also partially, uh, you know, why I have a bearish bias as well. So this pretty much sums up what I'm thinking in the week ahead. <clears throat> right. So, um, you know, we did that. Oops. So we did this determine our bias going into the next week. But there's something I, know I need to note. It doesn't mean right away I am going to buy the Australian dollar at the start of the week. Why? Because it's so overextended. Like I said, I use both technicals and fundamentals and market psychology. And, uh, well, quite frankly, this thing's overextended technically, right? I'm not looking to get in. Uh, no matter how strong I have an opinion on it, it doesn't fit my rules, right? It's uh, just too overextended. So for that reason, I'm keeping these biases, but I also need to wait for a good entry. So what that means is if 
you know, we do get a pullback on the Australian dollar. Um, and we do get a, a pullback on the yen the other way, right? So um, we see the yen gain a little strength. Australian dollar lose a little strength. Then I'm interested in buying, right? Because then we'll see a dip. And if I think the fundamentals are haven't changed, right? Then I'll be looking to buy it up, right? Uh, I'll be looking to buy um, the Australian dollar and I'll be looking to sell the yen. But if this thing just keeps on rallying, 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 I'm just going to miss the move. And that's that because I need to follow my rules and my rules tell me you need a good technical entry on a pullback. And this thing so far hasn't pulled back enough, right? Because, you know, this kind of trade where, you know, like my stops below here and I'm trying to target up here, it's pretty risky, right? Because this thing could easily just pull back and then continue higher. And I don't want to take an unnecessary loss um like that right so for that reason i just a little disclaimer that uh just because i have a bias doesn't mean i'm going to trade on that bias i need also the technicals to agree with me and i would like to see some profit taking occur on um, these currencies first so with that being said what pairs am i looking to trade well given i'm bullish on the aussie and i'm bearish on the yin naturally aj i'd be interested in buying right because um that does uh head higher when there's optimism so <clears throat> fundamentally aj is supported i'm looking to be a buyer on a dip as long as the fundamentals stay the same right so another thing i'm looking at since these are both neutral is uh potentially a ga short and of course last week that worked out perfectly nice shorting opportunity um, so I'll be looking for a potential pullback, and again, if the fundamentals stay the same for the pound and the Australian dollar, then I'll be looking for a short, similar with EA. Again, last week that worked out perfectly. Lots of members, uh, Swing FX members, caught EA shorts from right here and did very well. Uh, so yeah, essentially those are the main ones I'm looking at, right? Because the New Zealand dollar kind of bullish but not super bullish so i'd rather just not touch it at all right and only focus on uh, these four until something changes unless the new zealand dollar starts becoming much stronger than the australian dollar then i'd be looking at it more closely right because then there's a stronger bias if that makes sense so ea shorts uh ga shorts based on fundamentals makes sense uh, gj long makes sense and EJ Long makes sense as well because, again, uh, the yen, I am bearish, and the euro, I'm neutral. And same thing for uh, GA. Neutral on the pound, bearish on the yen, should head higher. So uh, those are the things I'm looking at, right? GN, not really interested in touching because this is, the pound's neutral. New Zealand dollar is kind of strong, so nothing really strong there. And then same thing with EN, right? Um just the fundamentals are not quite as strong as EA or GA. So for that reason, I'm just not going to focus on it, right? So I pretty much have my biases for the week, right? AJ long, EJ long, GJ long, GA short, EA short. All right, that's what I'm looking at at the start of the week. Now, as the week progresses and, and we see some more information come out, things can change, right? This is just my bias at the start going into the week so we've done that right so we determined which pairs and which direction i'm going to trade and now we can go into technicals and mark up the charts right now after doing all that is finally when we're we're using uh technical tools right so let's just do the basics here we have this trend line on g gj we have this resistance uh looks like we have that level this level this level right and i'm just using wicks and stuff to draw uh these zones right we have this level here and they're not super perfect, but 
they don't really have to be, right? They just need to be pretty good. So you have general levels um, now, and um, there's not too many trend lines here we can really draw, but uh, you know, let's see what we can find. All right, this trend line could be something, right? We have one touch here, and then we have two bounces there. Rejections there, support there, rejections there, some support here, right? So we have lots of interactions with this trend line. So I'm going to keep it, right? And obviously this trend line is pretty valid. It's in an uptrend. Um, so we're going to keep that. <sighs> Other trend lines we could draw here for resistance. Turn support looks like this one, right? We have rejections there, rejections there, and of course rejection there. Um... And then, so, let's see, we can maybe connect these guys, it looks like, right? So, uh, those are the main trend lines, right? Alright, so we drew the main trend lines, main zones, and of course our moving averages are already on the charts. Last tool I usually use is Fibonacci, so let's draw it here from the high, right, this high right here down to this low so we can see the 61 level uh, lines up nicely but it's not all just about technicals it's also about you know how strong are the fundamentals if the fundamentals are strong it's not going to pull back all the way down to here so I will be looking automatically at a smaller you know sort of entry um, and then we could draw this smaller fib on this sort of move higher right from this high to this low and then, uh, yeah, those are really the only Fibonacci's I need to draw because I am long bias, right? So I'm not looking to short this pair at all, even though it does look like it could be nice for a short. The fundamentals, you know, basically rule that out. And then in terms of targets, right, we have this 127 and we have this general uh, area, 127, 161, and a zone, right? So these are going to be like profit targets just naturally um, and then as far as entries go I would look to possibly enter around here reason being we have these trend lines matching up right not only that but on the one hour we have our moving averages in this general area and we have uh, this 78 level 78 level on the uh, higher time frame fib and then on this lower time frame fib we have the 61, 50, and 38 in this general area. So I will be looking for, uh, again, the fundamentals have to be the same for this to work, right? If they change, then my bias is going to change. But this general area is where I'm looking to get in, right? So let's say, you know, a trade idea would look something like this with a stop below here and then targets eventually up there right so trade idea would look something like that but we will have to see so that's gj now ga we're going to do the same thing right so let's draw the major zones out we have that major zone clearly we have this major zone uh, that zone that zone and this zone all right and actually looks like we might have one right there too all right so we have our major zones now let's draw this obvious fib uh, from this move lower right there to there and um, don't ask me why I draw the fibs backwards because honestly it doesn't really matter and I'm tired of answering that question. <sighs> I've answered it many times before, so uh, just 
please don't bother asking. Now, uh, let's look at some trend lines. All right, so we have this obvious one from those two points, and then we have this one like that, right, connecting these two points. Um, we have that one there. Looks like we have this one there. <clears throat> uh, and yeah, so now let's draw, I guess, uh, a little bit higher time frame fib from this this low all the way up to that high, right? Let's just do that. So now that we have pretty much all of our technicals that we need, well, actually, hold on, not quite all of them. Uh, all right, now that we have that level. Now we have pretty much all the technicals we need. Um, so obviously this general area, all right, let's look at the one hour. This general area has a lot of confluences. It would be a decent pullback for sellers to return. So um, yeah, so that general area is what I would be uh, potentially targeting, right, for a sell. <clears throat> so uh, yeah, let's move on to EA. EA is a little overextended. That's the only problem I see with taking a short on it. Um, but regardless, um, let's do this anyway. So there's lots of fibs you can draw, but um, I'm just going to do the two obvious ones, leave it at that. Now we can do zones. All right, so <clears throat> we have our major zones. Now we just add a couple trend lines. And there we go. So looking at this, I, I feel like a good area um, would be this general vicinity, right? That would be a pretty good pullback. We have, you know, moving averages. We have uh, Fibonacci levels and a zone. So lots of good good confluences in this area. Um, so I'd be looking to target that for then a short trade lower. EJ, um, I am long bias. So real quick, let's just mark off. Some trend lines, only some relevant ones. Um, I'm going to draw that one down the middle there because we do have some rejections off of this uh, continuously, right? So I would say about where it's at, maybe a little lower, looks like a, a possible good trade, right? Let's draw these fibs here. And as you can see, this general area has a lot of confluences, right? We have moving averages, tr a trend line, um, and lots of FIB levels. So this drill area is where I'll be looking to take a long trade higher, right? And um, it will depend again how things progress throughout the week. If it looks like the pound is stronger than the euro, then I'm only going to be looking at the GJ long, not the EJ long, right? So it's very dynamic. It doesn't mean I'm taking all of these trades just means these are trades I'm considering, right? So uh, yeah, this general area is where I would look to target a long. And then the last trade, last pair I'd be looking at trading is AJ, right? So let's draw that Fibonacci. Let's draw out some zones. All 
Okay, so we have some zones now. Alright, now that we have our zones, uh, we have um, our Fibonacci's. Um, now we just need to add trend lines and then we're good on the technicals. And I apologize if it seems like I'm going really fast. I'm just trying not to make this video insanely, insanely, insanely long. So, um, do forgive me. And it appears this general area um, looks like a pretty good pullback, right? We got trend lines, moving averages, fib levels, and general nice areas of confluence. So, this is an area I'd be targeting. And that sums it up, right? So, as you can tell, it's not a super quick process. You know, it usually takes an hour or two, but uh, it gets me mentally prepped for the week ahead. I know what I'm looking for fundamentally and technically, and uh, I have my bias for each, each pair, right? So, now I can go back and look at this, and I, need, I can make adjustments as needed as the week progresses, and thus, I would make adjustments to the trades I am looking at, right? Right, so I'm looking at GJ long, EJ long, AJ long, EA short, GA short. And I'll make adjustments to my biases on these pairs as the, again, week progresses. So. Well, that wraps up the full uh, weekly prep. Hope you guys learned something. If you have any questions, please ask me down below. And again, hit that like button and hit that subscribe button if you gain value. Um, yeah, let me know if you have any comments and I'll see you guys in the next one. From a town where most of the people are so close minded. They go into school and they work in a job, but they don't even like it. I won't be put in a box. Nobody telling me what I should rock. Nobody telling me what I should rock.